Welcome to the series that takes you to the heart of America, where we give you the big picture of what actually makes this country work. My name is Yul Kwan. I've worked in many different fields, from law to government to business. I've even won the reality show Survivor. This is impressive. But in every part of my life, I've been fascinated by the same things, systems and networks. The sheer size of this thing is incredible. In this series, I'm going to explore the remarkable systems that move us, feed us, and make our economy hum and how we put together the materials and manpower that keep this incredibly vast and complex country working day after day, hour by hour. Watermelons! Pick this morning. In this episode, we'll explore how America puts food on its table. An industrial revolution has turned our prairies and pastures into the biggest, most productive, most efficient food machine the world has ever seen. If you think of our food industry as a giant factory that's designed to feed us, what you see down there is a factory floor. But even though each part has been carefully designed, the machine as a whole has not. It produces more than we can possibly eat. Excuse me. And it pushes resources to the limit. It has the price of water been going up? Yep, just like my taxes. <laughs> as demand keeps growing, the system is under pressure. Well, you're not going to have pumpkins, you're not going to have apples, and you're not going to have cherries. But Americans count on the food industry to deliver. This is a story of how that machine keeps us fed 365 days a year. This is America Revealed. America Revealed is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Imagine a portrait of America showing all the food we consume. Each dot you see here represents a single food outlet of a nationwide chain. This is Subway's 24,000-strong empire, rivaled by tens of thousands of McDonald's, Burger Kings, and Wendy's, complemented by KFC and Taco Bell, Papa John's, and Domino's. Fill out the national menu with IHOP, Dunkin' Donuts, and Starbucks, and you have just some of the brightest stars in our dining galaxy. If you'd rather cook at home, you can shop at over 3,000 supermarket chains and hundreds of thousands of independent grocery stores in the U.S. Or you can choose from bakeries, gourmet shops, and restaurants that dot our landscape from sea to shining sea. Now, here's the challenge. In order to feed us, every one of these outlets has to be supplied with food. This frenetic little dot is the delivery end of a vast and complicated machine. Literally, we put a GPS unit on a pizza delivery man and recorded his typical Friday night in the heart of New York City. This is Raju Hussain, and he works for Domino's. So how long does your shift usually last? Eight hours, nine hours. And how many pizzas do you usually deliver? Wow, 30, 40 pizzas per night. Wow. I have one customer, they gave me $200 tip. Wait, what? I was like, wow. Pizza is an edible snapshot of American food. It's fast, it's filling, 
And from what you get, it's actually pretty cheap. Plus, it's completely customizable. You can get pretty much anything you want on top of the pizza. This is the final stage of the Domino's food machine. But where does it begin? Pull back a bit. Each of these streaking blue lines is another Raju Hussain, riding each night through the streets of Manhattan in a kind of crazy bicycle ballet. Like all great performances, what makes this dance possible is what goes on behind the scenes. This is Manhattan. A daily supply line brings Domino's ingredients here from a supply chain center in Connecticut. That hub supplies all Domino stores in the Northeast region. And Connecticut, in turn, gets fed with a constant stream of ingredients. Pizza dough, peppers, mushrooms, and tomatoes, often from clear across the country, all moved by satellite-tracked, refrigerated trucks to distribution hubs spread across our landscape. And it's all perfectly coordinated so that Raju Hussain can deliver a pizza to your door, still hot and ready to eat. But the story behind this food delivery system is even more remarkable. From New York City, I've traveled 3,000 miles to the other end of the continent to find out where one of pizza's key ingredients comes from and how it's produced on such a monumental scale. This is California's Central Valley, and my guide is farmer Ted Shealy. Ted, what are you growing out here? We grow fresh market onions, wine grapes, pistachios, cotton, wheat. We grow about 15, 1,600 acres of tomatoes. How many pounds is that? About 60 tons per acre. That's a lot of tomatoes. That's a lot of tomatoes. <laughs> Yes, the humble tomato, the foundation of pizza sauce. Ted and his fellow California tomato growers produce close to 13 million tons of them every year. That's nearly all the tomatoes America processes for foods like pizza sauce, ketchup, and salsa, as well as a third of those consumed by the entire world. Right up the road from Ted's farm, a half million tons of these red babies make their way through the state's processing plants every week. It's an industry worth an estimated $1.5 billion a year. But Ted doesn't just grow tomatoes. Like his neighbors, he produces an extraordinary variety of different crops. A staggering 50% of America's fruits and nuts are grown in California's Central Valley, what's effectively a giant open-air food factory powered by the sun. What makes this a perfect place to grow are the terrific soils, bright sunshiny blue skies, temperatures that range 95 to 100 degrees during the summer, cooling down into the upper 60s at night. The only ingredient that Mother Nature didn't give us was the water. But I'm looking around, and water is everywhere. It's not coming from the skies. This is the Central Valley today. And this, in a rare aerial survey from the 1930s, shows the exact same valley as a barren desert, the valley's natural state. It takes a lot of water to make this desert bloom. And that water comes from far away, 400 miles to the north. It's hard to believe, but this is the same water Ted Shealy uses to irrigate his tomatoes in the state's hot, dry south. And he gets to use it because of this, California's Shasta Dam, completed in 1945. The sheer size of this thing is incredible. For California's food machine to work on the scale it does, 
It needs vast resources and monumental infrastructure. Right now, I'm flying over fine examples of both. It's giving me a bird's eye view of how America puts nature to work. To learn more, I'm meeting up with Shasta Dam guide, Sherry Harrell. Shasta Dam is the keystone to the entire Central Valley project, and it makes it one of the leading producers of food and fiber for our entire country. Without it, buying a head of lettuce would be an incredibly big deal. We are actually now 428 feet from where we started up above, 174 feet above bedrock, and 67 feet past that concrete is Shasta Lake. There's over 450 feet of water behind that wall. Wow. So if that wall disappears, you and I are swimming all the way down to Los Angeles. A, a quick swim, too. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Starting at Shasta with the Sacramento River, the Central Valley Project connects 20 dams and reservoirs through 500 miles of tunnels and canals, turning 42,000 square miles of desert into what is, in effect, the world's biggest greenhouse. It's an extraordinary achievement in terms of technology and engineering and ambition. You realize how effectively and efficiently California has managed to maximize the one resource it never really had. What California has basically done is to turn dirt into pay dirt. And to understand just how successful California's tomato crop is, all I have to do is head next door to Nevada. These are California tomatoes, just over a million of them. 150,000 pounds of beautiful, juicy, smelly tomatoes. And they've been placed here in the middle of Reno, Nevada, not so that the good people of this town can eat them, but so that they can throw them at each other. Welcome to the Reno Tomatina, the country's largest annual tomato fight. All the tomatoes here are surplus tomatoes donated from California. But rather than throwing them away, they've been put to good use. They're here to support cancer research. And everyone here has paid $10 for the privilege of getting hit in the face with a tomato. Excuse me. This is just a fraction of California's tomato surplus, but that surplus is reliable enough to make the Reno Tomatina an annual institution. Over the last 50 years, the average American has come to enjoy a bounty of food never before imaginable. California's agricultural revolution is just one part of that story. This is another part, and an even more spectacular transformation. The Midwest. I've come in search of the quintessential American farm. And for me, that can only mean one place. Kansas. Remember Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz? That's where Dorothy's from. That's her home. It's a natural world there that Dorothy wanted to get back to after being stuck in that artificial land of Oz. Well, I got news for you, Dorothy. If you saw Kansas today, you wouldn't recognize it. To understand what's going on down there, I'll have to get a lot closer. From up here, a dazzling pattern of circular fields stretches as far as the eye can see. There's a good reason for this cookie cutter perfection. What you're looking at is one of the greatest land transformations in American history. If you think of our food industry as a giant factory that's designed to feed us, what you see down there is a factory floor.
I'm dropping into Stone Acres, the model of a multi-million dollar farm business. It's been owned by the Stone family for four generations. The ghost of Dorothy may be long gone, but at least Toto's still here. Toto, where are you? Toto! Along with the current owner, Greg Stone. Yuli, you made it. How was your flight? Nice to meet you, Greg. This is a satellite image of Greg Stone's farm. Just one of Greg's circular fields occupies a site of his grandfather's entire 1930s homestead. This is an aerial photograph of that same landscape in 1937. A totally different world. When Grandpa came here, there was absolutely nothing here. It was a barren prairie. He just pretty much started from zero. He had a few dollars in his pocket. The Great Depression had just kicked in, and, and, uh, and then we had the Dirty Thirties, which was a terrible time. People tried to grow wheat for a cash grain crop, a little bit of feed for the animals, just, just whatever they could grow to survive. Anything, you know, weeds, tumbleweeds. Tumbleweed? Yeah, yeah. That <laughs> was the crop it, it that was you grow? Thistles, well, they used it to feed the animals, heat their homes, whatever. And how successful was your grandfather in transforming this into a productive farm? He was successful, but uh, everything that he grew was basically for his family mm. and a few head of livestock that he had. But nothing, you know, on the scale of what we have today, of course, where we feed thousands. In fact, where his granddad harvested 20 bushels from each acre of land, Greg gets nearly 300. In the last 60 years, American farmers, on average, have tripled their yield, dwarfing the productivity of every previous generation. What changed? Like, how did you get to the scale that you're at today? Well, two things, irrigation and commercial fertilizer. America's post-war chemical industry revolutionized farming by mass-producing key soil nutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. When fertilizer became available, it was an immediate miracle drug to these, these crops. You could inject a small amount and quadruple your productivity without doing anything else. And then came the water. The late 1950s, the first irrigation wells were drilled in this part of the state. And Grandpa, he was one of the first in the area, though, to see that, that this was the future. Greg's fields are circular because they're watered by one of the most powerful and efficient inventions in the history of farming, center pivot irrigation. There has always been water beneath these once dusty fields. They just couldn't get at it. A couple hundred feet below where we stand here, we're sitting on one of the world's largest freshwater aquifers, really? the Ogallala. But the Ogallala aquifer was out of reach until after World War II when they finally had engines powerful enough to pump that underground water spanning 174,000 square miles to the surface. Fertilization and irrigation has changed the environment. It's changed the organic matter of these soils. It's, it's improved everything. It took just a couple of generations to go from granddad's dust bowl subsistence to Greg's high yield operation. And if you pull back even further, with the help of this satellite imagery, you can see thousands of farmers like Greg populating the Midwest with industrial-scale farms where once there were tiny individual homesteads. But this view from space doesn't show an even more dramatic change. Where Greg's granddad grew a variety of crops, 80% of these fields grow just one a single species that has come to dominate the farming landscape and the American diet. At 322 million tons a year, we produce more of this one grain than anything else, making 